שאלה של דיסציפלינה של הקהל, ארסון. זה כמו אצלכם שם, אם זה כפית על הנושא. רבותיי. רבותיי. כן. רבותיי. תקנו דיון שלא כתוב. לפני שנתחיל בהרצאה השלישית של בשבוע הבא תתקיים הראשונה בסדרה של שתי הרצאות. של פרופסור איתמר פיטובסקי, שיעסוק בקבלת החלטות במדעים על פרויקטים ענקיים, קבלת החלטות בפרויקטים ענקיים ובזרמים גדולים במדע. הוא גם ביקש מאלה שישתפו לקרוא, לעיין לפחות. במאמרים uh, פופולריים uh, יחסית uh, שעוסקים בנושא הזה. אני אפיץ אותם באמצעות הדואר. Uh, יש לי אימיילים של חלק מהאנשים, שיעבירו את המכתבים ממני, אני אעביר את זה גם דף, uh, uh, ואני מבקש מי שמעוניין uh, uh, לקבל את האינפורמציה כדי שבוע הבא, כדי uh, שבועות הקרובים, תהיה סדרה של שלוש הרצאות, שתי הרצאות של איתמר uh, פיטובסקי. ואחת של ליאור קורי מאוניברסיטת תל אביב. זה אשר לשבוע הבא, ועכשיו אני שמח, ואני צריך להציג את המרצה, פרופסור אמנה עופר, שיצא הרצאה עד כאן בתנאים קשים, מאוד בגבורה לפני שבוע, לפני יומיים הייתה הרצאה נוספת מרתקת עם דיון מעניין ביותר. שהנחה אותו פרופסור גבי הרמן, שראש החוג להיסטוריה כללית באוניברסיטה העברית, ועכשיו אנחנו, ההרצאה השלישית תעסוק בנושא between the gift and the market, the economy of regard. טוב, רוני, תודה רבה, ואני חוזר ומתנצל על כך שאני לא אדבר עברית, לא בגלל שיש לי משהו... נגד השפה העברית, להפך, אלא שפשוט המאמץ של לתרגם את ההרצאה הוא... קשה היה לי להכניס אותו ללוח הזמנים שלי, אבל אני אשמח לקבל תגובות בעברית ולנסות לענות עליהן בעברית, וגם התערבויות בזמן, במהלך ההרצאה, אבל בבקשה רק התערבויות לצורך הבהרה ולא לצורך מיקוח או ויכוח. אוקיי, הטכנולוגיה לא... אה, הנה זה עובד. אוקיי. כל האפקט הזה נגד. אז, זה פייפר יש לו את האורגן של עוד מאוד עוד פייפר, שהיה פייפר לפני 10 שנים, 1997. And with elements from this new book, which has just come out, uh, The Economy of Regard, uh, sorry, The Challenge of Affluence. Uh, the core of the book and of my work in the last 10, 12 years or so has been to understand well-being uh, a little better. So defining well-being as the objective. Uh, and in the first lecture, I set out self-control as an obstacle, as a problem in the achievement of well-being. And the book is called Self-Control and Well-Being in the United States and Britain since 1950. In this paper, I will talk about regard as the ultimate incentive. This is the second element in my conceptual underpinning, conceptual framework. Regard as the ultimate incentive. 
And the method, as an economic historian, is empirical, historical. I'm less of a theoretician, but there is a conceptual framework here. Most of the book, most of my work has been an attempt to underpin uh, my conceptual frameworks. And this is what it is called, the economy of regard. The problem is the persistence of non-market exchange in market societies. <coughs> Anthropology tells us about gift economies, archaic systems of interpersonal exchange. There's the potlatch, there's the kula. If you read the great classics of anthropology, uh, you have these elaborate systems of exchange. Uh, for example, Marcel Mauss in The Gift describes this annual gathering of tribes in the Pacific Northwest where the tribesmen compete with each other in giving each other gifts. These gifts are mostly blankets. So this is a, co a competition of blanket giving in effect which ends up with impoverishing some of the participants and creates the underpinning of the political system. Uh, we would have thought that this would have gone away uh, and indeed, there is a concept, several concepts, which tell us that sometime in the 18th century, the 19th century, a more rational way of organizing our affairs emerged, the great transformation to market ideology and practice. If you read uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, custom to contract, if you're in the British sphere of influence, Gemeinschaft to Gesell Gemeinschaft to Gesellschaft, yes, okay community to society. This is a big historical trope, how we moved into a market system. But non-market exchange persists, persists very widely. Uh, there's a not-for-profit sector. These figures are taken from, from the published version and they refer to particular places, but it doesn't really matter. So a not-for-profit sector which provides, in this particular instance, 4 to 7 percent of employment there's household production. Yes, is that for me? No. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so there's household production, which can be estimated that something in the order of a quarter of total income, even in advanced industrial societies, public sector provides 40% of resources. Uh, this is just a, a rough order of magnitude. So there's a great deal of welfare that we gain outside the market. Indeed, arguably, we get most of our welfare from outside the market. The rituals of hospitality, I expect that after this uh, lecture, you will very politely clap. You will return uh, the compliment. And I also expect with some confidence I will be taken to dinner. So the rituals of hospitality persist to the present. I don't expect to pay for that dinner. Uh, when the three angels turned up, was it uh, who, who, who uh, provided hospitality for the three angels in the Bible? Abraham. Abraham, okay. This is a senior moment. Uh, so when they turned up, then he washed their feet and gave them something to eat. Yes, so there's an expectation of uh, gifting of hospitality, uh, rituals of hospitality in the ancient world, which persists to some extent to the present day. Maybe you can close the door and we won't hear the speakers. Thanks. Uh, not non-market exchange also pervades the market and pervades politics. I won't talk too much about politics. Uh, you only have to read the daily newspaper to uh, find out about that. Uh, and there are quite a few different approaches to this type of issue. I'm just listing some of them. So some people talk about altruism, there are social preferences, there are a market failure, public goods approach, new institutional economics has things to say about it, agency theory. There are various conceptual frameworks which help us to understand why goods are not exchanged, uh, not priced and not exchanged for money. My take is, can be seen as part of an effort to enrich the repertoire of economic man, uh, like my previous lecture in this series, uh, and that has been increasingly legitimized by behavioral economics, experimental economics, maybe neuroeconomics. Uh, and I'm going to focus on the intrinsic benefits of social and personal interaction as the incentive. 
Uh, the satisfactions of regard. This is a term that I use for these intrinsic benefits. <coughs> it's all in the mind. Emotions are the ultimate incentives. All satisfactions are, in the final count, psychic. Uh, now, what is the ultimate satisfaction? Arguably, the ultimate satisfaction is self-worth. We basically want to feel good. We want to feel good about ourselves. Uh, now, self-worth requires external validation. It's difficult to sustain a sense of self-worth without its being validated from the outside. Now, before you start raising your hands and saying that this is all possibly intuitively plausible but wildly speculative, uh, I have the authority of uh, the founder of economics, Adam Smith, uh, said these things in very similar words. Indeed, the term regard itself is taken from Adam Smith, and this is what he said. What is the end of avarice and ambition, of the pursuit of wealth and power and preeminence? <clears throat> what are the advantages which we propose to gain by that great purpose of human life which we call bettering our conditions? What is the payoff to economic growth, says Adam Smith? What is the payoff to wealth? To be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy, complacency and approbation are all the advantages which we can propose to derive from it. Not some of the advantages, are all the advantages. So, if it's a speculation, then I, I have a great partner here in whose shade I'm happy to stand. Uh, and so I lump all the benefits of personal interaction, all the different words that we have for this. Acknowledgement, attention, acceptance, respect. You read them. I call these things regard. Regard basically means attention with a positive component, someone else's attention. The problem of regard is quality control. How do you assure that you're getting good stuff? How do you assure that you're getting genuine regard? External validation of self-worth needs to be authentic. It needs to be authenticated. In order to be credible, yeah. it needs to be voluntary. You don't want someone to have a good opinion of you because you paid them for it. You want them to think well of you of their own volition. So, this is satisfied by discretionary reciprocal exchange. In other words, uh, this is not contractual. Market exchange is immediate, uh, instantaneous, and mediated by prices. Reciprocal exchange is discretionary rather than contractual. You don't actually have to reciprocate. You have the option of reciprocating, or perhaps the option of not reciprocating is more realistic. And the delay in reciprocation allows for the exercise of discretion. Uh, it doesn't have to be returned immediately. It allows for the exercise of discretion. Regard needs to be communicated. Yes, since it comes from the outside, it needs to be communicated. And the choice of the signal authenticates regard. You need to choose the right signal uh, in order to authenticate regard. Since this is discretionary, since this is voluntary, I call it a gift. <coughs> Exchange is personalized by the gift. You remember that personalization is the critical issue here. Hence the avoidance of money. In general, we don't give money in, uh, in uh, reciprocal gifting exchange with the, exce with the exception of, uh, I have to say, of both Jewish and Chinese weddings. Uh, so regard is not for sale, essentially. Now, how are we going... Okay, thank you. That's, that's a slightly different problem. Uh, so, okay, so far we've talked about the demand for regard, but how do we guarantee its supply? Uh, well, it's really very simple. To get other people's approbation, we just supply them with our own. That is the mechanism. Yes, we want other people's regard, and to get their regard, we provide them with our regard, and that generates a reciprocal cycle. Now, the first mover gift, there, is a, there has to be a first mover in this. 
The first move of gifts begins a benign cycle of trust. You can think of gifting as the exercise of trust. Uh, I'm handing over, I'm giving over something of value with the expectation, with the hope that this will be reciprocated. Uh, and the important thing about this exchange is that it has intrinsic benefits which are over and above the gains from trade. This type of exchange generates not only the standard gains from trade that economic exchange generates, but also an additional intrinsic benefit. Now, this is a, a slightly subtle point, uh, which is, I'm often asked, where does altruism fit into this? I think that altruism needs to be possible in order for the first mover regard to be credible. We need to, be be we need to believe that there is a possibility that someone will give us their unstinted regard without us having done anything before. So that possibility needs to be there in order, in effect, to motivate uh, this process. I'll, I'll be speaking about mothers quite a lot. <laughs> Yes, thank you, that was good. Okay, now, interesting enough, for those who think these things are important, it can be argued that uh, recipro reciprocity also has the property of allocative efficiency. If we use the model of perfect price discrimination, uh, as you know, in ordinary exchange, the law of one price prevails, there's one price for everyone, but there is one model where we actually can find out how much a person is willing to pay and to charge them exactly that price. And that model is called perfect price discrimination. And arguably, uh, gift exchange or reciprocal gift exchange conforms roughly to that model. Uh, every provider is a monopolist of her own regard. No one else can provide her regard. Others cannot trade in it. It's not tradable. It's an interpersonal relationship. Hence, there's no consumer surplus. Normally, with trading, if it's worth something to you more than the one price, and there is a consumer surplus, in this case, there's no consumer surplus. Uh, the payoff, as I said, are the gains from trade and the satisfactions of regard, the warm glow of regard. Uh, you give a gift and you create an obligation to repay, an obligation to reciprocate, and the producer surplus is taken alternately, first by one side and then by the other side. Uh, and in repetition, the price converges on the marginal cost, and that's how we get allocative efficiency. Now, I wouldn't take this too seriously, but some people like this kind of thing. So the point is that if this is not um, efficient in the economic sense, uh, it's good enough. It's good enough for people to engage in it in a variety of settings. <coughs> Another way of thinking about it is in terms of a bond. This is quite a useful concept. Uh, bond is a word which has several dictionary meanings. Uh, this set of mutual obligations is actually quite stressful. You know, I have to go to this... Uh, I have to go to this wedding tomorrow and I have to give this gift and I'm worrying uh, what gift I should bring and that was actually nothing as compared to the problem of bringing gifts to all the people I know in Israel <laughs> for this visit, uh, which seriously strained my, my, uh, my, luggage, uh, my luggage allocation. So this business of reciprocity is quite stressful uh, and if regard is asymmetrical, if it arises between sides which are unequal in their capacity, uh, then it provides a form of domination. And there's a little quote here from the anthropological literature. Uh, it creates a bond in the sense here of a repetitive exchange. This is one sense of a bond. It's a human bond. Uh, an implicit contract, uh, an emotional link, and a fetter, in other words, uh, a form of subordination. These are all terms for which the word bond is appropriate. It's, self, it's a self-enforcing process, which is driven by the fear of the loss of regard, which, as I said before, ranks very highly among, our, uh, among the incentives. 
And you also have, these are not only benign gift cycles, you also have pathological gift cycles, like the feud or the duel or uh, divorces also have this quality of uh, uh, repetitive, rep repetitive exchanges, in this case of insults and injury rather than uh, gifts and benefits. So you just have to change the sign. And that is one virtue of the market. Yes, the market is liberating. Uh, there is a famous article called What Does the Economist Economize? by, I think, Hubert Henderson. And he, his answer is, the economist economizes on love. So love is a kind of scarce resource, and so the market liberates us from the need to use it. Uh, the norm of first mover cooperation breaks the prisoner's dilemma deadlock. We've seen uh, in the previous lecture, we looked at the prisoner's dilemma and wondered how we were going to, how we were going to get out of it. Well, this norm of First mover cooperation, which is implicit in these gifts, uh, breaks this deadlock, motivates trust. Uh, you know, you know all of this. Uh, okay, it's interesting. I went to a lecture earlier today, which was about animals, but uh, focused on uh, or converged on very similar ideas to the ones that I'm presenting here, and he presented virtually the same. Uh, <laughs> the same material from the same articles, but hopefully some of you are not entirely familiar with it. So, uh, you know, this is the famous ultimatum game where I have to share 100 pounds with you. If you reject my offer, we both get nothing. How much should I offer? This is a very famous game by now. Uh, and, but we have some new, relatively new results about this. This has now been extended. We all know that educated people in Midwestern colleges tend to give 50%, more or less. But uh, we now have uh, new results. This research has been extended to uh, various, uh, how shall I call them, archaic societies, undeveloped societies, anthropologically studied societies. And you can see that these represent the size of the various offers. So this is our Midwestern university, not quite Midwestern, but uh, all the rest are savages of various kinds. Uh, with, with apologies for the term, it's so convenient. And you can see that actually the, it's interesting that the noble savage is actually less noble than commercial man uh, up there. But never mind, you, you get the picture that there's a strong norm of, is it a norm of reciprocity? Some people will say no, this is just prudence actually. What you see there is prudence. Uh, but there's also the dictator game in which uh, only the giving is there, the need to reciprocate isn't. And there's also a positive share out, which is quite high, something in the order of 20% uh, or so. Uh, and here's another game of this kind, the public goods game, in which each citizen is invited to contribute to the community, uh, but is not compelled to do so. And everything, everyone is compensated including the refuseniks, uh, with a payoff which is proportional to the total contributed. So should I contribute or not? Whether I contribute or not, I'm getting the payoff depending on how, how many other people have contributed and how much they've contributed. There's been a lot of research on this. People do tend to contribute, but not all of them. I run this game in my classes and my students are actually pretty nasty lot, it turns out. They think it's actually it reflects well of them, on them uh, if they refuse to contribute. They get me completely wrong. Uh, and I, give, I attribute this to the effects of an education in economics. Uh, at any rate, this is a game of this kind. The axis here is, this is own contribution. And this is the average contribution of other group members. This is from a famous, by now famous article by Fer and Fischbacher. Uh, so, what it shows is how much I will contribute depending on how much other people contribute. And you can see that there's a group here who always contribute nothing. 30% uh, of people just free ride. They don't understand this game. They don't understand why they should give something for nothing, especially since they can get something for nothing. But that's only 30%. Another group uh, start out by giving, but then they notice that some people are not giving, and so they stop giving. 
Uh, and in this particular experiment, uh, how many are there of them? 14%, I think. I can't, here it is, the label. 14%. But most people, 50%, continue to contribute, although uh, not proportionally, not as much as they could. And this is quite useful because it tells us that people are heterogeneous in these preferences. And this is quite a useful finding for our theory because heterogeneity validates discretion. If you actually have a choice, if you have a real choice of whether to reciprocate or not, whether there's some certainty or uncertainty as to whether you'll reciprocate or not, then the fact that the real world is heterogeneous, yes? Uh, yes, this is, this is the total average. זה כן משחק חוזר, כן. מה שקורה זה שהם מגלים שיש קבוצה שלא נותנת בכלל. כן, אבל ככל שהממוצע עולה, הם עדיין נותנים פחות. כן. גם כשאחרים נותנים יותר. כן, התמימות שלהם, האידיאליזם שלהם נפגם ללא תקנה, אפשר לומר, כן? אני רק מדווח, כן? לא עשיתי את הניסיון הזה בעצמי. אוקיי. Now, here's another twist on the same game. So you can sacrifice some of your gains to punish non-cooperators. That relates exactly to your point. And what happens then? Uh, if you sacrifice, so this is a story without punishment. Uh, it doesn't e really even matter what's the scale here. It's about a scale of giving. Uh, and you can see that uh, without punishing the defectors, the proportion given declines. But once you start exercising punishment, once people allocate some of their resources in order to punish the non-cooperators, then suddenly the cooperation level rises uh, very substantially. So that suggests that reciprocity, again, can be efficient, especially if we throw in negative reciprocity. To descend from, uh, from uh, behavioral, behavioral uh, experiments, uh, just look around us. Language is a gift economy. I say good morning to you, and if you don't answer back, if you don't reciprocate, then there's a problem. I smile at you, you, you smile at me. You know, that, makes, that gives me a warm glow. Advertisers know this, by the way. So are gestures and nonverbal communications. We're engaged in kind of gift exchange all the time whenever we communicate uh, with people. Uh, does it confirm an evolutionary advantage? Well, we know of these theories of reciprocal altruism in uh, nature, so there are models of that kind. Uh, I won't really go into this. Uh, there are various evolutionary just-so stories which, if you like that kind of thing, we can tell stories about why we evolved uh, evolution, these, these, uh, uh, these types of preferences. In fact, one of these stories was told in the <laughs> lecture this afternoon. Uh, but what is interesting is the effect of face-to-face -face appeals. There's an article that uh, is called Giving to Charity, Yes, Since You Asked. Yes, so this is what uh, money raisers have discovered, that if you approach people personally, it's much more difficult for them to refuse. Sorry. Begging is quite a problematic story because this is a unilateral transfer. You give something and nothing is given in return. And begging generates quite strong negative emotions, I think, because of this attribute. We have very few instances of public unilateral giving of this kind. So just to summarize uh, this story, it's a voluntary transfer and expectation of reciprocity. It's notionally open to discretion as to value and time. In many, many cases, the obligation is so powerful that it's very rare to find anyone who does not, uh, who does not conform. But at any rate, it's important to have this notional discretion in order to maintain uh, the value of uh, reciprocity, motivated by a desire for regard, uh, so on and so forth. And it establishes a repetitive self-enforcing bond which facilitates trade. So that's the basic model I'm working with. Now, 
as I said, the work is largely empirical, so I'm beginning to, I've pulled the curtains, opened the window, looked out, and looking for instances of this. Uh, the most important locus of regard is the household. Spousal and parental bonds, both of them, you can think of them as reciprocity cycles. You can think of how people get married, how children get educated. All of these processes have these cycles built into them. I've actually written about this in quite a lot of detail. And the most important thing from an economic point of view is that this provides a motive for reproduction. Uh, we all, societies expect to get their manpower uh, or the humans uh, for nothing. Uh, there's no market for buying people. Well, you can buy migrants, I suppose, but on the whole, we expect to get our uh, people <laughs> for nothing. They're produced by the economy of regard for our benefit and uh, for our use. So <laughs> this is an extremely important issue. We can imagine markets for babies. There are actually markets for babies. Uh, nevertheless, most of us prefer to get our babies not over the counter, but in some other way, through the economy of regard. The gift of life. The gift of life, I'd say, is a primary example of uh, this regard gift. Economically worthless, not in the past, but in the present, it's economically worthless, emotionally uh, priceless. Uh, and just to remind you of the massive costs of child rearing, there are various estimates in the literature which you can take seriously or not. Uh, however you take it, the cost of children is very, very big. So you could buy a house which you could never afford, actually, <laughs> if, you, if you are raising children. Uh, and so on and so forth. And the, most, the, the main thing that I'd like to say about this is that the value of children must be more than they cost. Otherwise, we wouldn't spend that much over them. Uh, let's look at other examples about the household. If we think of the process of economic growth as the... Uh, as the relentless rise of the market, then we can see trends in the other direction. For example, uh, working men have retreated from, uh, from the labor market. They used to work 65 hours a week. They now work 42 hours a week. They've withdrawn time from the market and have invested it in the household. Uh, so one way to evaluate this is by means of uh, total income. This is a procedure which is called extended national accounting. You take the national accounts and you uh, attribute prices to some of the, some of the uh, uh, sources of welfare which are outside the market. This has been practiced quite, uh, quite extensively. Uh, and what we find when we apply this particular procedure is that the bulk of welfare priced in these kinds of dollars uh, is actually acquired outside the market. That's a, a somewhat disturbing finding. Uh, and it suggests some aversion to market transactions. You know, why do people choose to get welfare from outside the market rather than from the market? Because uh, it's not only that gift exchange has intrinsic benefits, arguably market exchange has some intrinsic detriments. People in some circumstances would prefer to avoid it. So here's an estimate of this kind in one of the classic articles, Nordhaus and Tobin. Uh, and what this does is it just evaluates three elements of the national accounts. One is leisure, which is given some plausible value in dollars. The other is uh, non-market, which is basically household production. And it's standardized on GNP. In the United States, at various points between 1929 and 1965. And uh, I think the one to look at is household production, non-market production. You can see non-market production persists as a proportion of GNP over this whole period of time. This leisure uh, variable to some extent encompasses unemployment, so much of it is actually involuntary. So there are problems with this procedure, but nevertheless it gives you a sense of what we're talking about. How do you measure non-market? Uh, 
we attribute a dollar value to household work. Now, there are various ways of doing this. One way is to measure it in terms of what it would cost to employ somebody from the outside to do this work. Uh, the other method is to ask what income do women in particular sacrifice uh, when they do housework and you get different estimates but at this level it doesn't really matter. Uh, but this only comes to 1965. Sorry? The reason I ask is because this only comes to 1965 just two years before the Great Feminist Revolution. So what would be... I'm going to talk about that as well. I'm going to talk about that as well. So, uh, okay. So here's another one. This is actually after the Great Feminist Revolution. So uh, what we have here is domestic work as a proportion of national product. Again, this is something you don't want to look too closely at, but it's basically calculated in the same sort of ways. These are various estimates. You can see that we have from the United States, we have two estimates. One is as a proportion of GNP, and the other is as a proportion of the total income system of accounts, which is done by Eisner. Uh, and one for Australia and one for the UK. And uh, I think the main thing we get out of this is that this is pretty big. <laughs> Housework is something on the order of, take it between a quarter and 40% of total income. Uh, and that it's quite inelastic, you know. This, is, this covers quite a long period of time, but it's still responsive. It's still quite responsive not quite responsive, but you can see that it fluctuates in response presumably to external shocks uh, of various kinds, so that's quite an interesting finding. Family bonding does a lot of work in the economy, more work than it's usually given credit for. It goes beyond raising children and looking after them. Uh, for example, um, self-insurance in, uh, say, simpler societies, family members are uh, responsible for each other, there's intergenerational transfers, caring for people at old age, this is all well known. Migrant remittances, that's a big puzzle. People go away for long periods of time, sometimes they never return, nevertheless they send enormous amounts of money back. Uh, for some countries this is the main source of foreign exchange. So this is quite big. Unpaid caring. Uh, people who look after their parents, for example, people who take time off to look after their disabled children and so on. Uh, in the UK, one reports 6 million carers. The population in the UK is about 60 million. 15% uh, of adults, 19% of households. If you want to estimate the shadow wage, if you had to pay all these people at plausible rates, you'd end up with 7.5% of GNP. Uh, which is comparable to what the UK spent on the health service at that time. So there's an enormous amount of unpaid labor, labor of love, if you wish, which is being spent there. Uh, there are large bequests. You know, people give money uh, after their death. Now, that's irrational. Dead men have no interest. Why? Why would they do that sort of thing? Again, that's a very large uh, component. And life insurance, you know. If you're dead, what do you care uh, what happens after you die? Nevertheless, life insurance is a thriving, uh, thriving industry. Uh, so we can see family firm as, well, uh, that actually relates to the next slide, which is family firm as an agency solution, which is how to get people to do what you want them to do, the principal agent problem. Uh, a good example of this is farming. Farming, in general, is an extension of household production. The, the dominant form of agriculture in the world operates as an extension of the household economy, uh, and we see the repeated failure of large-scale uh, agricultural enterprise, latifundia, plantation, collective farming. All of these systems fail after quite a short period of time. Even in the United States, uh, you know, 63% to 87% owner occupation. The basic unit is owner occupied and the proportion of labor in American farms, you know, America, the center of capitalist agriculture, there's still in 1985 more family labor than hired labor. Uh, and what we have here is the combination of worker control and the family incentives which I described, the reciprocal incentives, 
solve the agency problem. Solve the problem of how to get someone to do something for you when you're not looking over their shoulder, which is quite a problem in agriculture, which is, as you know, spread, spread out. Now, so the farmers are in an interesting predicament in that they work for love, but they sell for money. And that gives them a particular sense of, particularly strong sense of desert, uh, a claim of virtue. Yes, uh, they think there's something special, and farmers the whole world round think that there's something special, and that is the basis of moral claims which they make on society, and these claims are very large. United States farm support, in the European Union there's this irrational common agricultural policy. In Israel, the kibbutzim used to have these types of claims. Uh, so farmers claim and get uh, unusual, unusual uh, types of support, uh, and arguably this arises from this moral economy which operates in the midst of the market economy. Okay, I was looking for a empirical handle on these issues uh, and uh, that requires me to make a detour into the issue of status. Uh, if you're looking at the total provision of well-being, then status is, I think, fairly obviously a powerful motivator. Uh, and I've tried to study this, I've tried to evaluate this, but I won't tell you about it. This is peripheral to what I want to tell you. It has provided me, though, with a handle to examine a little more closely the operation of the economy of regard and its change over time. So, here's a little detour into status. So. The question was, how does affluence affect status? <clears throat> the first thing that we find is, when we look at the literature of subjective well-being, uh, that women are as satisfied as men, on the whole. And whether they're housewives, whether they're working, whether they're higher paid, lower paid, uh, gender doesn't seem to make much of a difference, which suggests to me that some kind of equilibrium process is in operation there. Uh, Measures of status. Uh, the two dominant measures of status is using social classes, social stratification in terms of classes, and some continuous ranking. Uh, classes are mostly used in European sociological analysis. The Americans prefer continuous ranking. So that's what I'm going to do. Now we can measure status from the bottom. How better off am I than let's say the bottom. I call this uh, advantages. You can think of this as feel-good status. So, I'm better off than everyone who's below me. Or we can measure it from the top. And this actually has uh, a term in the literature, this is called complaints. You can call this feel-bad status. Uh, how do you relate to people who are above you? Uh, the continuous measures tend to be derived from income and occupation. These are the two components of status, income and occupation. And there is one dominant measure uh, which is very widely used in the United States and this is called uh, Duncan's Socioeconomic Index. And what it does, it takes income and education in equal measure. I won't go into why it was done that way but it has stuck. That's the important point. It, it's open to all sorts of criticism, but it has stuck. Uh, and so what it measures is a score compared to the bottom. It goes from 3 to 96. Uh, I call this the advantages or the feel-good measure. Uh, you can think of it as capabilities in the Amatya Sen sense, or you can think of it as a measure of human capital. These are various ways of thinking about what exactly this thing measures. Uh, and it's dominant in the United States. And the really valuable thing about it is that the uh, University of Minnesota has uh, taken a 1% sample of the American census going all the way back to the 1850s for every census, and they've also signed a socio-economic index score to every person in that sample. So first, that's a validator. If they've thought this is worthwhile, then probably we should think it's worthwhile. And also, it has the great advantage of being available. So
So each one of these people is available. So I've done a little work on this 1% American sample. Uh, and then I went a step further and said, since I want to measure the effect of status on well-being, one of the things we need to do is to measure status. And uh, I've just followed the method we use in economics, which is to take the total resource and divide it per head. So just as you can have total income divided per head, and that's GNP per capita, I said, let's take total status and divide it per head, and that gives us socio-economic indicator per head. Do you understand this notion? This is basically taking everyone's status scores, multiplying it by the number of people in each category, dividing it by the total number of people, and we have a social, socio-economic index per head. Uh, and when we do this, we get an interesting paradox. Working women's average stock of status is equal or higher than men's. That goes against expectation. We wouldn't have expected that. So what's going on here? You remember that uh, the Duncan Index is made up of income and education. Well, we don't need to worry too much about income because we know that income has gone up. It's interesting to see what's happened with education. Education is really the important thing to look at uh, in this context. And this is what's happened. What we have here these are the education levels of USA, white women, age 22, 42. I've taken this age band as the age of fertility, essentially. Uh, and this takes us from 1940 to 2000. We don't actually have an observation for 1950. Uh, and what you can see, and these are educational levels. So this is below nine years, this is below high school, this is full high school, this is college, and this is professional and uh, doctoral. So what you can see here, the big, the bottom line or the big story here is that in 1940 more than 60 percent of women did not have a full high school education in the United States and by the year 2000 uh, this figure is less than 10 percent. This is really the big story. I think in my view this is the big story of affluence. This is where, this is the biggest uh, payoff, the biggest benefit of affluence. Uh, and the interesting thing, it's come not from the market, but from the public sector. Uh, this really big benefit is largely the creation of a society rather than of the market. Uh, so let's look at some statistics. This all comes from the same source, where uh, I use the 1% sample. So this is fairly widely known, which is, uh, this is a participation rate. So this is how many female workers there are as percentage of males. You can see that the percentage is growing uh, all the time until the number of women almost matches the number of men in the labor force. And this is the wage rates as percentage of men, which is also something that you know. And what you know is that women earn less than men. Now let's look at the socioeconomic status scores. And uh, you can see that women have a higher socioeconomic status than men. Now, I immediately want to concede that I think that there's a problem with these figures. So, my concession will go to the extent that I will say that uh, women seem to have a higher or equal socioeconomic status to men. We could go into the sources of this difference, but at any rate, they're not lower than men. No, no one has managed to find all the surveys that have been done that women have a lower socioeconomic status than men. Uh, these are two other sources uh, using different indices, not the Duncan index, but different indices. These ones show a rough parity between men and women. I've actually uh, carried out a procedure of taking these, taking these uh, uh, rankings and going to the census and multiplying it by the numbers and deriving an average score. And you can see that they match pretty well. Uh, these are census years in the United States. So, uh, this is terrible. I, I'm losing a bit here, but I think I just about get the right bits. So, as I said, women's socioeconomic index is greater or equal to men. Uh, you can see this in these columns, 
29 verses 36, 32 verses 38, and so on and so forth, up to 2000, where there's still quite a big difference. Uh, the most important thing which explains this, in my view, is that if you look at the standard deviation, if you look at the variance around these numbers, is that it's much wider for men than it is for women in all of these columns. Uh, and you can see these are uh, distributions uh, for three points, 1940, 1970, 2000. There's a column for, for women and there's a column for men. And what you observe is that the, the tails of the distribution for women are shorter and lower than for men. So women, there is the glass ceiling. You don't find women, say, above 70 or so here, whereas you do find, still find quite a lot of men. And likewise here, you find many more men above the glass ceiling than you find women. Uh, but the interesting thing is that you don't find all that many women below the floor as well. That is the other story, the other side of the story. Uh, so they also stay out of the bottom, and the reason they stay out of the bottom is that motherhood provides an alternative to work. Motherhood, if you wish, provides a reservation wage. Uh, they will not take a job. This is white women only, with blacks it's a slightly different story. So uh, women will, on the whole, generalizing on the average, you know, all the qualifications, uh, will not take the lower paying posts when they have the option of motherhood. So homemaking is attractive to low education women, but less attractive to high education women. This is quite an important distinction. Uh, so there is a, a trade-off between children and job satisfaction. And the argument is that you can obtain regard either at home or at work. Uh, I have observed the satisfactions of motherhood. I have to say I haven't experienced them myself, but uh, observations suggest that there's a lot of emotional energy flowing both ways and you can get, it's difficult not to get a great deal of approbation from someone small who is entirely dependent on you. So there's a great deal of regard to be had out of motherhood, even at the lowest income levels. Uh, the higher up you go in the uh, occupational ladder, the occupational scale, the more regard you are likely to get at work. And that suggests that there might be a trade-off in which you can choose to get your regard out of motherhood, or you can choose to get it out of work. Uh, and we can see this in this particular diagram. What we see is this is uh, a diagram which is uh, meant to represent lifetime childlessness uh, by educational level. So what we have here is these are the t temporal observations from 1940 to 2000. Each of these colors is a different level of education, the same levels of education that we had in the uh, previous diagram. So in 1940, 55% uh, of college educated women have no children at home at age 40. We can say in general terms with all the noise is that they've remained childless. And you can see that if this trade-off operates, it operates in 1940 uh, in a linear way and quite strongly. From 19, I don't have an observation for 1950, but from 1960 onwards, that only remains true of women at the highest educational level. At educational level five, uh, you can see that there's still a very high likelihood that they'll remain childless. Uh, this becomes lower and lower and lower. The level of childlessness in general increases, which suggests that there's more satisfying work to be had if this model is anything like correct. And by the end of the period, we have a bipolar distribution where we have two kinds of uh, women who are likely to be childless. One is those with very low education who p possibly are not very good marriage uh, prospects. And the other is this group of professional women at the other end. Uh, but 
as you can see from this diagram, motherhood is still chosen by a majority of women at all levels of education. And uh, this one represents childhood, uh, sorry, lifetime fertility. And what this suggests is again that there's a gradient in 1940 in which these are just the mothers, again by educational level. Uh, so the mothers in uh, 1940, the mothers of, uh, with a college education are likely to have fewer children. This fits, for those of you who are familiar with, this fits uh, the Beckerian model of uh, the, the new home economics. But then the model breaks down because from 1960 onwards, it seems that at all education level, those women who are mothers have about the same number of children. They have, you know, in the 60s it's more, in the uh, 80s and 90s, 2000s it's less. But those mothers who do have children seem to value motherhood regardless of their level of education. Uh, and here I'd argue that the cost of motherhood is a measure of its value. So motherhood here has an intrinsic value which even people with high earning prospects are willing to uh, invest in, in a similar way to those that uh, others are. And so what we have here is an instance of, or potentially what we have here is an instance of the shifting boundaries of the market and uh, the gift economy. Here again, you've seen this already. And what this generates is, this is a total fertility rate. So the stylized story is that in the 1940s and the 1950s, American women with low educational levels find motherhood very attractive. By the 1960s, they're beginning to increase their educational endowment. And so they withdraw from the gift economy into uh, the market, however, there is a level below which they will not go. There is a level of investment which they will maintain regardless of how much human capital they've invested. And the next one shows you the median age of, at marriage, which once again suggests a gradual withdrawal from the gift economy to the market economy, but not a total withdrawal from the gift economy to the market economy. Okay, that was the detour through status. I'm going to run quickly through the rest of the work that uh, the economy of regard does. One is labor markets. Uh, this will be familiar to economists. The phenomenon of efficiency wages in which workers' loyalty is purchased with above uh, market clearing rates. There's this interesting uh, work by Truman Bewley who showed that employers will not reduce wages in a recession. Instead, they'll fire people, but they want to keep the loyalty of their workers. Uh, the different types of industrial relations regimes, tight monitoring versus discretion and trust, these are two different options. A discretion and trust one is an economy of regard one. And there are various examples. And some economists have analyzed this to argue that uh, we have a gift economy in the workplace whenever there are many dimensions of quality. Whenever it's impossible to monitor all the things that people do, in these circumstances, uh, we have to trust the workers, and in return the workers trust us, we create a climate of trust, and that is the motivator. The economy of regard is the motivator. Professional ethics are an example of that. Yes, people get academic tenure, they become unfireable, uh, and we rely on the economy of regard to keep them going. Uh, and this raises problems when we invite external management to start manage our universities and they only know about payment by results. Uh, so in payment by results incentives in public services undermine the intrinsic motivation of the economy of regard and we often have these competitions between the two incentive regimes within the same institution at the same time. Uh, when I gave, uh, I once gave this paper at a, at a conference where uh, someone said it was impossible to get a good plumber. Uh, and so I inserted this at that point. And the point is that we all ask each other, do you know of a good plumber? So that suggests that there is such a thing as a good plumber, although a plumber has all the incentives to defect. 
Uh, nevertheless, we all believe that there is a good plumber and our neighbor employs him or her um, if we could only uh, get them. The economy of regard pervades the activity of selling. Uh, look at the hospitality and catering industries. People like to do things together. Uh, there are a few solitary eaters, a few single rooms, so a lot of that activity is, actually provides the framework for regard. There's the gift industry. Uh, Christmas is the most important seasonal fluctuation in retail. Uh, this relates to my work on advertising. I have an argument that what advertising tries to do is to mimic interpersonal relations. In other words, to mimic the economy of regard. Uh, and you can find that uh, in the book. That's about 2 or 3% of GDP. But the interesting thing is much more is spent on personal persuasion in marketing than is spent on impersonal advertising. Uh, about 8% of the labor force is a whole theory of relational selling in business schools. Uh, many of you will be familiar with Hayek's theory of... Uh, what's called spontaneous order, which is generated in a world in which prices are the only signals. Uh, and impersonal selling has this quality. It economizes on information. But it turns out that for a lot of transactions, we don't actually know the price. We have to discover the price. The price covers a multitude of dimensions. This has to be covered through a process of bargaining in which the regard incentives uh, come in again. I made this discovery uh, for a while. I became a, a, a trustee in some operation which involved businessmen. And one of the curious things I discover is that they have much firmer handshakes. And they, they pat you on the shoulder much more frequently than in academic circles, for some reason. Uh, yes, Aruchai Skit, I discovered this uh, on this visit to Israel. So, uh, business is carried out, yes, over lunch. Uh, all these hotels are full of businessmen trying to uh, achieve what they couldn't achieve uh, impersonally by force of personality, by meeting their clients and pressing their hands and uh, feeding them and so on. Uh, now, the demand for authentic regard exceeds the supply. <laughs> There's not enough of it available. People don't love us enough, really. Uh, the authentic type of love that we want, and the market steps in to provide us with pseudo regard, which is captured in the phrase, have a good day. Yes? Well, do they care whether you have a good day or not? Uh, but nevertheless, this is pseudo regard, uh, for which there is considerable demand once again, and the market will provide, will mimic regard quite widely. Uh, entrepreneurship. Most entrepreneurs fail. Now, entrepreneurship, Entrepreneur who has nothing, normally, the definition of entrepreneur is some, someone who has nothing except persuasion. Yes, they, can pers they have an idea and they go to someone who has money and they tell them, please give you your money so I can carry out your idea and with a 90% probability they're going to fail. They quite often go to their friends. Uh, so, once again, I'd say that entrepreneurship is driven by the type of trust that underlies the uh, economy of regard. Mafias, old school ties, blood, protectia, guanxi in China, these uh, reciprocity networks are pervasive in different cultures. And what they do is they secure expectations in the absence of contractual protection. Yes, where we cannot trust the property rights regime, when we cannot trust the courts, these things work. These things underpin our expectations. They are a substitute for the market and especially for the property rights. Uh, I won't go into this story. Quite a lot of the difficulties that Western business has in China is not understanding that relationships there are not impersonal and contractual, but they are personal and reciprocal. That is the basis for securing, for a robust uh, agreement for a robust implicit contract in China. Uh, I don't know whether I should show you this. Uh, this is an attempt to try to model the relationship and the boundaries between the two economies. So I'll just uh, mention it very briefly and perhaps sufficiently briefly so that none of the distinguished economists in this room can catch me out. 
Uh, basically, what we have here is the two economies. We have the gift economy in red, uh, and that's for warm, and the conventional market economy in blue. And here we have a category of goods which are only available in the gift economy. Think of the gift of life, uh, which is almost only available in the gift economy. And so that's one possible boundary of the gift and the market. Uh, and this is a category of goods here, which can be provided both by the gift and by the market. Think of insurance. We can get insurance uh, in the gift economy, in the family, for example. That's very expensive. We can get it much more cheaply in the market. Nevertheless, some of us prefer to get it in the gift economy. And uh, now, let's think of an economy which perhaps is growing or expanding or is becoming more productive. These boundaries, oh yes, there's another thing. So, this is the amount of real regard then, that we can get. This is the authentic regard, but there's still unsatisfied demand for regard, which is pseudo-regard. And uh, the market can get a premium from the punters or the suckers or the customers uh, for providing pseudo-regard up to this point. Uh, and, you know, we can imagine that the economy becomes more productive and the various boundaries then move in response to higher productivity. I won't spend our scarce time discussing what happens here. Uh, and so this is my conclusion. And my conclusion is that reciprocity endures. Regard is a good which impersonal markets cannot supply. And I'd go further and say that the wealthier we are, the more we value it. Uh, whenever incentives are affected by, it exists, whenever incentives are affected by personal relations, whenever we interact with people, the element of regard enters the consideration. The boundaries of the gift in the market are essentially determined by technology, I think. Uh, by how easy it is to do things in one sector or another. So mobile phones, for example, have enormously extended the economy of regard. You know, teenagers can maintain the economy of regard 24 hours a day uh, with their mobile phones. Remittances, network externalities, uh, and so on. The archaic rituals, which I described in my very first slide, the potlatch and the kula, I'm told on good authority, continue to exist today. Blankets are still being exchanged. People still go on long uh, trips over the Pacific, this time with motors, uh, but nevertheless, these rituals still uh, continue. And likewise, I would argue reciprocity will persist or even increase as a substantial complement to impersonal markets uh, and of rising demand with rising wealth. So that's it. Thank you very much. Well, the prediction, prediction was borne out, yes? You all did your bit. של אנשי עסקים. 
אני חושב ששם הנקודה העיקרית זה תקנות מס הכנסה. אם יש לך אקספנס אקאונט, אז אתה נוסע ואוכל על חשבון האקספנס אקאונט. אם אין לך, אז אתה מוצא דרך אחרת איך להיפגש עם אנשי עסקים. אוקיי, נתחיל בנקודה השנייה. זו נקודה טובה, כי אפשר לבחון אותה מאוד בקלות. כי יש ארצות שבהן יש הנחה ממס, ויש ארצות שאין הנחה ממס, ואני זוכר אפילו שהייתי באוסטרליה, בתקופה שהייתי שם ביטלו את ההנחה ממס, ולא ראיתי שנס... שנסגרו הרבה מסעדות. אבל זה עניין שאפשר לבחון אותו בצורה יותר מוצקה. לגבי עניין הילדים, אני מסכים שזה נשען על... נטייה מולדת, אם תרצה, להולדה, אבל לפני שמגיעים למצב הזה, יש מחזור של משא ומתן. יש מחזור די מורכב, ריקוד די מורכב של משא ומתן, שבו שני הצדדים מנסים לתהות על קנקנו של הצד השני. ואני אפילו מתאר את זה בספר, יש איזה פרק שמציג את התהליך הזה, וזו הנקודה שבה נכנס ה-Economy of Regard. הבעיה בהולדה, בעיקר בחברה אה, ליברלית, בחברה שיש בה שוק חברתי, זה לדחות על קנקנו של הצד השני, the authenticity of regard, האם הוא באמת אוהב אותי, כן? זאת, זאת הבעיה למעשה, כן? כי התגמול, התגמול הוא יכול להיות מיידי, אבל המחיר הוא הולך ונמשך, ולכן התהליכים האלה של the economy of regard, הם לדעתי חשובים בהגעה אל מימוש הפוטנציאל הזה, והייתי הולך מעבר לזה, ואפילו אני הולך מעבר לזה, ומנסה להראות בספר איך כאשר המכשולים לאמון נעשים יותר גבוהים, כאשר יש בעיות יותר גדולות ביצירת האמון הזה, הילודה יורדת, הנישואים נדחים, ואפילו מוסד הנישואים עצמו מפסיק להיות, מפסיק להיות כלי עיקרי לעשות את זה. טוב, אני מעדיף לא להשתמש במונחים מעולם הדרמה, כן? הדברים האלה... הדברים האלה מדידים. לא רק שהם מדידים, אלא הם נמדדו, ולא רק שהם נמדדו, אפילו אני מדדתי אותם. כן? כך שאני מתייחס לעניין הזה, ואפילו במצגת הזאת שראיתי כאן, זה הראה את התהליכים האלה. יש לי כאן כמה סלייד נוספים, אני נתתי את ה... יש... אפשר לארגן את הדברים בהרצאות מסוג שונה, אבל אפשר להראות שהתהליכים האלה מוליכים לשיבושים מאוד רציניים באיכות חיים של אנשים. כשיש הטיה של, הטיה של העדפה לטובת השוק, זה כנראה פוגע במנגנוני ההערכה העצמית, או בריאות הנפש, או דברים מהסוג הזה, ואחד התהליכים שמלווים את כל העניין הזה, זה עלייה רצינית בהפרעות נפשיות. עלייה דרמטית, אם מותר להשתמש במושגים שלך, עלייה באמת דרמטית, ב... תפוצה של הפרעות נפשיות 
בארצות שהיא מותאמת לעלייה ברמת ההכנסה לנפש, ויש גם ענף, ענף צדדי של המחקר הזה, שעוסק לא בהפרעות נפשיות, אלא באפקט של, של מטריאליזם, של חמרנות. כשבדקו את ההשפעה של חמרנות, כלומר, איך אנשים מדרגים תגמולים? אלה שמעריכים תגמולים, תגמולים שוקיים יותר מאשר תגמולים בין אישיים, מסתבר שיש להם יותר, יותר הסתברות ללקוט בבעיות ב- 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 של אי שביעות רצון, בעיות נפשיות, בעיות מהסוג הזה. יש תוצאות דמוגרפיות שבכל זאת צריך באיזושהי צורה לתת עליהן דין וחשבון. למשל? מספר הילדים במשפחה. כן, כן. כל הנתונים המובנים מאלה נלקחים בחשבון. אם יש נתונים שאדם רגיל לא היה חושב עליהם, אותם אולי אפשר להכניס, אבל באופן כללי נדמה לי שהתייחסתי, ודרך אגב, אני לא היחיד שעושה את הדברים האלה. יש זוויות שונות לעבודה הזאת, אבל זאת תוצאה שהיא די ברורה. כן. אקשיינג' שהוא אימפרסונלי הוא גם לא אנושי. חסר בו המימד. העניין הוא שעושה רווח בזה, זה העניין, זה מה שפוגע שם. ולכן הסטטוס החברתי של הסוחרים לא גולם, את העתיקה, ואם זה משנה אם זה סוחר גדול או סוחר קטן הוא מאוד נמוך. לא, אני מקשיב, אני מוכן גם להקשיב. העניין זה, כן, לדעתי, אם, אם, תרשה לי לקחת אולי את השאלות אחת-אחת, כן, לפני שאני אשכח אותן. מה? חשבתי שזה רק שאלה אחת. לא, אמרת שיש לך שתיים, טוב. לא, יש לי עוד אחת. כן, כן, טוב, בואו ניקח את זאת. אם מותר לי להגיד, יש פה איזשהו כשל לוגי, כן? 
מדוע כאשר שני בני הזוג עובדים אין להם מספיק? להפך, הם יכולים שניהם לעבוד חצי הזמן. יש כאן בעיה נוספת שאתה לא ענית עליה ולא רמזת עליה, מדוע מתעוררת בעיה כזאת? במידה מסוימת בעיה הזאת באמת מתעוררת. אבל זה לא בגלל ששני בני הזוג עובדים, לכאורה יש להם הכנסה כפולה, מדוע הם צריכים, מדוע הם שניהם צריכים לעבוד, מדוע הם שניהם מוכרחים לעבוד. אני מציע גם שלא תענה לי, או אתה יכול לנסות לענות, כן? מה? כן? למה? כן. רגע, רגע, בוא נעצור רגע. מה הסטטוס של המאה שמונים תגובות האלה כראייה? איזה מין ראייה זאת? לא, לא, הבאתי... מה? הבאתי את זה כדוגמה. דוגמה למה? מה? דוגמה למה? הבאתי את זה כדוגמה לכך שלא בהכרח נשים עובדות כדי לקבל סטטוס, או כל הדברים האחרים שאתה מבין אותם, אלא מכיוון שאין להם גמירה. אני בכלל לא... רגע, על סמך זה שיש נשים שכותבות שהן אומרות שאין להן ברירה. אלא מה? זה נושא שם. אני הבאתי משהו בלי זה ללא ספק, תמורה נפשית, לא תמורה סטאז, תמורה נפשית. ואמרת שיש את שני סוגי התמורה האלה, ושאחד מפצה על השני במידה מסוימת, או שיש ביניהם יחס דומי, הבנתי אותך נכון? כן, כן. אוקיי, אז מה שאני מנסה לומר לך, על סמך הדוגמה הזאת, אבל לא רק הדוגמה הזאת, הבאתי אותה רק בתור קוריוז, זה שאולי פשוט התחלמת מגורם שלישי, שלא יכול לעבוד עליו אף מילה, לא מה שאנשים רוצים, אלא מה שאנשים מוכרחים. שצריך להבין את העולם לא במונחים של מצד אחד תמורה כלכלית, מצד שני סיפור נפשי, אלא שיש קוטב שלישי למשולש, תמורה משולש כזה או כך, והקוטב השלישי הזה קוראים לו duty obligation don't choice. אוקיי, אני כותב על זה באריכות. אני מסכים, לא, לא אמרתי, כן, לא יכולתי להגיד את הכל, אבל לא, אני כותב על זה באריכות ואני מסכים איתך שהמציאות הזאת נחווית כמציאות שאין ברירה, שהיא נובעת מחוסר ברירה. אבל הסיבה שהיא נחווית כמציאות של חוסר ברירה היא לא מהסיבות שאתה מראה אותן, אלא מסיבות אחרות שהן די מורכבות, שאין לי פשוט זמן להיכנס אליהן, ושאני מרשה לעצמי להמליץ על... דיברת עליהן במידה מסוימת בהוצאה ראשונה. לא, לא דיברתי עליהן. אני עוסק בסוגיה הזאת, אבל לא בהרצאה הזאת, כי אני אפשר להקיף את הכל. אוקיי, בסדר, אז אני אסתפק במה שאמרת עכשיו. שאי אפשר להקיף את הכל, מילים אחרות, ההרצאה שלך שניסתה להבין את העולם במונחים של מצד אחד אה, תמורה חומרית ומצד שני סיפוק נפשי, היא לוקה לא בחסר. חסר בה עוד אלמנט אחד שהוא, אולי אין, אבל צריך לא להסבר אותה מדוע אין, שהוא חובה. בוא נעזוב את הנושא הזה, יש לי עוד שאלה. Okay. אולי עוד יותר חשובה. אה, תראה, לא לגמרי הבנתי לאן אתה חותם. האם אתה רצית לומר שב-1940, שזה היה המועד הכי מוקדם שהגרפים שלך הגיעו, ב-1940 חל שינוי בסיסי ביחס, בכמות היחסית אפשר לומר, של סיפוק חומרי לעומת סיפוק נפשי? או שמא התכוונת לומר בדיוק ההפך, שלמרות כל הדיבורים על מעבר לכלכלת שוק וכולי 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 וכולי, כן? המצב הבסיסי, כן? שבו יש גם זה וגם זה, ושניהם חשובים, לא השתנה או כמעט לא השתנה. וכאן אני לא חושב בטוח, האם מדובר בדרכה בתפנית שחלה לצורך העניין מ-1940, כמעט פרויאנסקי, כן? או שמדובר בהמשכיות. מה בעצם הטיעון שלך? למעשה אמרתי את שני הדברים. חכה רגע, תן לי להסביר. מה שאמרתי, שמצד אחד, 
היקף ההזדמנויות, היקף האפשרויות לסיפוק שוקי התרחב בהרבה כתוצאה מהרחבת ההשכלה. מצד שני, אם אנחנו מסתכלים על העדפות של אנשים, מה שאנשים בחרו לעשות זה שההעדפה, ה... נקרא לה העדפה הביתית או העדפה האמוציונלית או העדפה הסיפוקית, נשארה בעינה, כן? נשארה לה עוצמה חזקה, ועכשיו הכלכלן יכול אפילו לשבת ולחשב מה שנקרא אלסטיסיטיז, ואפילו אני, אני רמזתי לזה, כן? שאפשר אפילו לחשב באופן, באופן קונספטואלי, באופן מעשי זה יותר קשה. יש גם מודל די דומה בכלכלה, שהצורה שה... שהוא בנוי הוא קצת אחרת, הצורה שהוא בנוי שם זה שיש לאנשים ברירה בין סיפוקי שוק לסיפוקי משפחה, ואז הבחירה שהם בוחרים, הפשרה שהם בוחרים, וכאן דרך אגב נכנס אלמנט ש... שלא, שלא דיברתי עליו, שאתה רומז עליו, זה שהם בוחרים שיהיו להם פחות ילדים שבהם הם משקיעים, בכל אחד מהם הם משקיעים יותר. אבל לא ברור במודל הזה מדוע, המודל הזה של בקר לא מסביר אף פעם מדוע הסיפוק החוץ שוקי הזה קיים, הוא פשוט מקבל אותו כנתון. הוא לא מסביר, וכאן אני מנסה ללכת קצת יותר עמוק ולהסביר מדוע הסיפוק הזה קיים. עכשיו לדעתי המודל הזה לא עובד כל כך טוב כי ניתן היה להניח שככל שאנשים הם יותר עמידים גם יש, יש, אין כאן ניבוי חד משמעי, אבל אה, שיהיה פיחות במספר הילדים ככל, שה, ככל שהתחרות הזאת מתגברת. על כל פנים, צריך להסתכל בצורה יותר מדויקת, ומה שאני רואה זה שלמעשה אה, הדרישה לילדים היא דומה מאוד בכל הרמות, ואם יש משהו, אז דווקא העניים יש להם את המספר הגדול ביותר של הילדים, שזה עניין די בעייתי. כן, כי לעניים יש דרכים, דרכים אחרות להשתמש בכסף. על כל פנים, לעניין הזה, לעניין הזה אז אני נכנס, ופשוט לחזור ולסכם, אני אומר ששתי הנקודות תופסות, שמצד אחד השוק נעשה הרבה יותר מושך, הרבה יותר חזק, מאידך רק קבוצה מאוד קטנה, אם ניקח אימהות כקנה המידה, כן, רק קבוצה מאוד קטנה בפסגת הסולם התעסוקתי, בחרה לחרוג בצורה מובהקת מנניח שאר, ה... שאר קבוצת הנשים ולהשקיע להשקיע בצורה מובהקת יותר בשוק מאשר באימהות. איך אתה מתייחס למסורת הסוציולוגית שמדברת על אותם הדברים שאתה מדבר עליהם, ציינת יותר את האנתרופולוגים, אבל הרבה בעצם עם הטענות שאתה מנסה אותם, מזכירות את זימל, מזכירות את גולדנר, מזכירות גם הרבה מאוד פוגעים בעצם עכשוויים, מעונת ל... קבוצות של כלכלנים בצרפת, סביב הרב דימוס, אולי שמעת עליהם, שכולם בכל מיני צורות שונות ומוכתבות, בעצם אומרים דברים מאוד מאוד קרובים למה שאתה אומר, קרי שיחסי נתינה, מתאמים, מתקיימים, ממשיכים, אולי מנצחים אפילו את יחס השוק, או עם חלק מן השוק. כלומר, הכיוונים האלה. אז איך אתה, איך אתה מתייחס אליהם? כלומר, אם אתה לומד מהם, האם אתה שונה מהם, כלומר, אם אתה מכיר אותם? שנית, השאלה היא יותר פונדשן בעצם, זה באיזו מידה בעצם, אם שמעתי אותך נכון, בסך הכל עדיין אתה נשאר תחת הפרדיגמה, אולי בצורה הסופיסטיקטית ביותר ששמעתי עד כה, אבל הפרדיגמה של בעצם מקסימיזציה, של אייג'ן שמנסה בצורה מודעת או בלתי מודעת, אפילו 
בצורה של הסימבוליקה של גור דיוד, למקסם את המיצוב שלו מבחינת סיפוק נפשי אפילו. ועד כמה אתה אולי בכל זאת רוצה לקפוץ החוצה אוקיי, תודה רבה, זה שאלות טובות מאוד. קודם כל אני מאוד מעודד שאפשר לחשוב על זה כ-out of sample test, כן? זה שאם התופעה היא באמת כל כך אימננטית, אז לא מפתיע שאנשים חוקרים אותה ומגלים אותה מחדש במסגרות שעומדות לרשותם. ואת רוב האנשים שעליהם דיברת אני לא מכיר, מאידך יש אסכולה סוציולוגית אמריקאית. של מה שנקרא בזמנו Exchange Theory, שדווקא אותו דנקן היה אחד מראשי המדברים בה, והומאנס ודנקן זה שני אנשים שכתבו במסורת הזאת. וזה לא מפתיע שהדברים האלה קיימים, היית מצפה שהם יהיו, כמו שהם היו ב... אצל הומרוס ואצל אריסטו, אני חושב שתמצאי את זה בכל, בכל תקופה ובכל מצב, זה באמת אה, תכונה מאוד עמוקה. עכשיו, לגבי ה... המקסימיזציה, הייתי אומר שהייתי רוצה להימלט מזה, אבל אני לא יכול. אני לא רואה, מה? אני לא רואה איך לצאת מהעניין הזה. ודווקא בפייפר הראשון שלי, מה שהצגתי זה שאלמנט נוסף של המודל הזה של המקסימיזציה מראה לנו שלמעשה מקסימיזציה היא מקסימיזציה במימד שחשוב לנו, שהוא המימד הבין זמני, שמקסימיזציה היא ברוב המקרים בלתי אפשרית. מסיבות שהצגתי בהרצאה ההיא, ואז אנחנו תלויים, אנחנו נשענים על הנורמות החברתיות, על המסודות החברתיים. את יכולה להגיד שאולי הנורמות האלה והמסודות האלה אומרים לנו מהו הטוב החברתי. כן? שאיכשהו החברה או ההיסטוריה יצרו uh, ביטויים של, נניח, הטוב, הזכרתי את הנישואים, הזכרתי את החינוך, uh, דברים מהסוג הזה, כלומר, uh, במימד אחר של העבודה, אני אומר שהדבר הוא לא אפשרי, או כלומר שהפרוצדורה שה, הרציונליסטית, היא נתקלת בבעיות, uh, גם בעיות לוגיות, גם בעיות פסיכולוגיות, גם בעיות של אינפורמציה, יש, יש מערכת שלמה של בעיות שהיא נתקלת בהן, ש... ניתן לומר שבאופן פרקטי חלק גדול מהבעיות האלה הן בלתי פתירות והפתרונות הקנוניים הם עצמם נורמות חברתיות. כן, אפשר לראות בפתרונות הקנוניים פתרונות לבעיה של האי פתירות. זאת הטענה ש... שטענתי שם. אבל כאמור, יש, יש סמויה בכל העניין הזה שאלת האלטרואיזם. אם יש אלטרואיזם לשמו. ומה שניתי, שניסיתי להגיד בהרצאה הזאת זה שבשביל שהמערכת תעבוד אנחנו חייבים להאמין שיש אלטרואיזם לשמור אבל בסופו של דבר זה עובד לטובתנו אם זה עובד לטובתנו האם זה באמת אלטרואיזם לשמור את הבעיה הזאת עוד לא, עוד לא פתרתי אנחנו נצטרך לסיים אני שמח שבאופן אישי כיוון שקצת מסתכל על דיון במצב שתי הרצאות האחרונות שלך הסתכלו בעצם באותו מקור. דיון שהיה, גם דיון בנבחר קצר, על מידת הנורמטיביות של הגישה הרציונליסטית, הרעיון שלנו, הומון ונומוקוס, המקסימיזציה וניסיון הפתירה שבין... אני חושב שעורר בנו הרבה מאוד מחשבות. אני מוכרח להודות תזכיר יום כמו שהיה לך אתמול, לא יהיה לך באוקספורד עד הקיץ אז אנחנו נודה לו על שבא, על שיהיה עוד עינינו גם לנו לחשוב, באמת תודה רבה תודה על ההזמנה טוב, שבוע הבא כאמור, איתמר פיצובסקי, החלטות מרכזיות בתחום המדע, מתורת היחסות, אבל הוא יתחיל בדברים שמתקיימים היום. מי צריך להמשיך עם שונים שמונה מיליארד דולר? אז תודה רבה.